Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Muradas Casas, and um, we're here to welcome you to the Language Teaching Forum. This is our first workshop of a series of many. And the reason why we, Thomas, Rafael, and myself, thought that it was a good idea to create a teaching forum is because we felt that there was a need to have a space for language teachers to talk about, to discuss concerns that we have when it comes to teaching in our classrooms. So welcome, and now I'm going to pass it on to Rafael. Hi to everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm the health and safety guy. So a couple of things. Um, facilities are just opposite the main door, the main entrance, just, just the other side. And um, fire alarm. We don't have a test plan for today, so if there's a fire alarm, uh, there might be a fire, so we need to, <laughs> I mean, it's real, we need to evacuate the building. There's a fire exit there, and there's another fire exit there. And, um, yes, oh yes, one more thing. There's, um, there's a door, if you go down the stairs, the door, the door on the left is alarm, so please don't use it unless there's a fire, of course. Okay, it's a fire exit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I pass it to Tom. Hello, I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, Bill. Uh, Bill has an extensive experience as a language uh, teacher. He spent 15 years as an EFL and ESP teacher in Europe, Hong Kong, and the Middle East before coming to, to York to work uh, initially in the EFL unit, now SELF. Uh, and he taught on various programs uh, on English as a foreign language, but also English for academic purposes. Uh, he completed his PhD la last year, 2014, and moved to the Department of Education as a teaching fellow. And he works mainly uh, on taught master's programs in language education. Uh, he also took on last year the role of uh, program leader for the MA in TESOL. His research interests are in ESOL, teacher education, second language writing, and academic writing and feedback in higher education. That's mainly what he is going to talk about today. So welcome and thank you, Bill. Thanks, for Thomas. This. Right, thank you very much for that big build up. Um, uh, so it's great to be here for this first of, um, as Maria said, hopefully many workshops. Um, what I'm going to talk about it in the title, I hope, isn't too misleading because. Um, I'm actually, the aim today is a workshop, so I'm going to be talking for, I hope, no more than about 35 minutes. Um, normally, I don't like doing sort of lecture talks, and in classrooms, I like to interact and do a lot of interaction. But because of the way we've organised today, that all the sort of, we're going to try and get to you talking, sharing ideas in the workshop situation later. So I am going to try and just talk at you, right, which I don't like doing, but I'll do it for about 30 odd minutes, okay? Um, it would be good probably to keep questions until later so that I don't, you know, just ramble on and we, we, we eat into our workshop time. Is that okay? But certainly there'll be plenty of time to talk about anything that, that's raised. If you make a note of anything that, you know, you specifically want to talk about. Um, I am going to be you, talking about some examples from some of our colleagues in the audience today. So it could be that they may want to, you know, correct any misrepresentation or, or comment on things. So we might may also do that. Um, you can see that the aim really is to look at formative writing, opportunities for formative writing, but also, uh, I didn't put this in the title, but it's really quite important to what I want to do today, technology, right? Harnessing technological tools in terms of creating, you know, writing tasks, enhancing our teaching and assessment of writing. Um, and the main focus, of course, is to try and, you know, open up a lot of questions um, for you to discuss and for us to share our own experiences and ideas from the classroom, okay? So um, these are the kind of things that I want to talk about. Just quickly looking at some factors in designing tasks, um, writing tasks particularly, then some examples from some of our colleagues here as well as my own. Uh, Google Sites, some little bit of discussion of e-portfolios as well. Um, blogs, blogging, okay? Um, and then finally, um, just a short section on formative feedback using audio and screencast, screen capture commentaries, video commentaries, right? And again, one of my colleagues here in the audience will be featured there. Um, so the principal focus is really 
I am going to talk a lot about technology, really. Technology is the way that we reach audiences, so we've got to think about the challenges for foreign language teaching, especially um, I'm today looking at writing. Um, so how can we make these kind of tools, the blogs, the wikis, right, the, using websites, how can we make them work for us in our own context? I'm going to be talking about higher education, I guess, the university context, but I'm hoping that anyone who's not from that kind of context can uh, relate to some of the challenges and issues that we talk about here um, more generally. And the second that question here is one that I'll come to towards the end, looking at making formative feedback more effective through audio and video commentary. Okay. <coughs> ah, we seem to have a problem. Oh, no, no, no. Is it? Oh, yeah. there we go. Why, I wonder why that happened. Right, so, technology, yeah, good, good, well spotted, well spotted, problems already, we'll come back to that. Okay, I just wanted to, I don't want to make this terribly theoretical, and I, but I wanted to have some sort of reference, right, when we start talking about examples. So, in terms of motivating tasks, and I guess we could talk about some of these kind of factors for any kind of language task, but particularly for writing, um, just to highlight some of the things that we'll come back to and discuss with each of the examples, I'll... I'll, I'll present. Um, one of the key things that, we've, that was always drummed into me as a language teacher when I was starting out in training was the, the importance of interest and fun and enjoyment, right? So in terms of motivation, we definitely need um, to think about that in terms of intrinsic motivation, making our tasks interesting and fun. And then the question is, of course, how do we do that? And interest in writing could be very different from interest in actually the content that you're engaging with. Um, another point that's worth thinking about is achievement, right? Um, which is really about matching students' capability with the challenge of the tasks. And again, this can have a big impact on, on motivation and creating tasks which, which actually motivate our students to write. Um, and we're aiming for, obviously, a high level of motivation, well, you know, a high level of challenge, but high level of um, capability would lead to, to high motivation, right? And I'm quoting William here. This is Dylan William, who doesn't, he's not a language teacher, but he's written an awful lot about formative assessment. And it's, it's all good stuff, actually. It's, it's US, it's American, but I do still quite like him. So you know, I'll, there's a reference list later and one or two things that you might want to follow up. Um, and a key point, I think, that we need to work on really thinking about as a reference for, for uh, tasks is the audience, OK? Um, this is particularly important if we talk about technology and some of the tools that we'll be talking about and tasks that you create with, it, with the tools because this is one of the claims, I think, for a lot of the technology that it can provide, you know, it can create this audience. Uh, typically, we've got, you know, audiences are, the audience for a piece of writing for a student is the teacher, right? But with a lot of these sort of um, technological tools available now, we can create other audiences. You know, students will write for other students. They'll write for people on other sides of the world. And so this is a, a, something which can be quite a, an important sort of benefit to look at. And maybe finally, um, thinking about, again, creating tasks which um, motivate students and our um, collaboration. It, a lot of has been written about that in recent years. Collaborative tasks. Clearly, collaboration involves interaction between students, okay, at different levels. Um, technology, again, can provide, you know, th that opportunity for collaboration, which maybe wasn't around in the past. So, bearing these kind of things in mind, we'll come back and, and sort of make reference to them um, by looking at, you know, when we talk about some examples. Okay, so I'm going to go, in this first part, talk about some examples of, of tasks and with particular uses of technology. And I'll start with Google Sites. This first example is just uh, from um, the EAP teaching that I, I've done, you know, and this happened, this took place a couple of years ago with a group of pre-sessional students on a, something like a 20-week program. And in the early stage of that program, we were developing their general English skills, not their academic English skills so much. And one of the sort of formative tasks that we set up was a, a group project on, on a Google site, okay? Um, and it was, it was to create this sort of, basically a web, web page um, with a team collaborative pro project. The focus was on uh, some 
aspect of British culture that the students were interested in. And these students were from quite a lot of different parts of the world, really, um, China, the Middle East, etc. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was no Europeans there, so the, the, a lot of the kind of British cultural things that they were really quite interested in. And as you can see, pubs was one of the kind of interesting ones. And strangely enough, Yorkshire pudding, food, okay, British food always comes up, partly because I think the students can't believe it. They can't believe how bad it is, I think. Um, but it does come up. Uh, so this was the, that, that was the basis of this kind of project, right? So it was formative. There was no summative assessment. We didn't grade them. Um, but they collaborated in teams and they created these websites with, with the, the Google Sites, okay? And Google Sites it, it is a kind of a structured wiki. So you might, you know, you've probably heard about wikis. I've never been, I've never really kind of engaged with that term, I, I guess. But uh, I mean, it's basically just a, a website for collaborating with where you have every member of the team can edit and, you know, revise the work that's there. And we also posted comments. You can see in the corner there one comment from me. Uh, all teachers were able to comment on, on the work. Um, students would then, could then revise, you know, related to comments that we made. Some of those comments might have been on presentation and accuracy of language, for example. Um, I think the spelling of pudding was picked up by one of the teachers actually for, the, for this one because only one D had been used throughout in the first, you know, the first um, sort of presentation of it. So anyway, th this was an example of um, using Google Sites, creating some kind of collaborative project. And writing is at the sort of heart of it, but we weren't giving it a grade. We weren't summatively assessing it. So how did that kind of rate in terms of some of those factors, those aspects that we talked about earlier? Well, in terms of audience, it definitely created some audience there. It wasn't just for the, for the teacher. It was for all the teachers in, in the program at that time and all the other students. So uh, that kind of worked quite well. They read each other's, they found some points of interest in there. Okay? It was definitely interesting for them because it tapped into their own curiosity, in this case about you know, British culture, cultural behaviour, customs. Um, it was collaborative. It definitely involved a lot of teamwork but here's something straight away that I'm sure people will, will relate to um, it's very difficult with these kind of projects to know how much effort is going in from each student right so that's no, never evidence not easy that's maybe something for discussion later with these kind of collaborative projects how do we know how much effort is going in and what our students are doing and one other thing that came up and I think this comes up an awful lot when you're using sort of online tools there was a kind of invitation there to plagiarise, and it can happen very easily, and we had to be very careful with that. Um, the feedback in this case was quite limited from us as tutors. We, we focused on the content. I guess the point about these kind of projects is they are very much meaning content focused, right? They lend themselves to that. Uh, students are writing um, in a very, you know, the, the, the meaning is, is for, you know, at, at the front there, not the language. But equally, how do you focus on language and language accuracy? Maybe that's a kind of challenge for, for this kind of project. So that's one example, and it's one that, uh, that maybe it's worth pointing out that we, we did it with one group. We, we moved on. We, we had sort of different things happening the year after. I don't think we used it again. And one of the things that kind of occurs to me is that, that it, you need to follow these things up. The students need to, you know, doing something as a one-off, maybe not very, very successful because you need to sort of develop some kind of familiarity with, with what you're doing. And this will come up again, I think. And now I'm going to refer to the Tango project, which was LFA project. Carmen was very involved with this. So if I, make, if I say anything, and if I say anything that, that's, that's out of place, you can just correct me here. Um, it was used with an LFA level two Spanish class last year, I think. It was a, a, a project which required funding from the university to set it up. Um, Basically, the idea was kind of pairing up students from Oviedo in Spain with students here. So you had Spanish speaker, English, English speaker learning Spanish, Spanish speaker learning English, um, and, a, and a kind of a sharing um, one of the key events each week, I think it was, was it each week, uh, was a, a Skype interview which, which would be conducted in both, you know, the Spanish or, or, and English, there would be half and half. Um, the whole project was based around setting up some tasks. Um, so, for example, um, in each week there would be a different task. I think literature, uh, Spanish contemporary literature was, was one example here. And resources would be put together, so there's lots of listening, reading, 
uh, you know, we've got videos here. Um, and students would then discuss the information that they got, what they'd done with these tasks in their Skype interviews. So you can see quite a lot of really good integrated work going on there. Um, I think this is, yeah. You can see the hairy bikers there, for example, a video, because obviously the focus there was on food and recipes. And I think, I think the task there was, um, yeah, let's just go back a minute. Yeah, the task for that one with the, 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 uh, the hairy bikers one, I think, was, was Cornish pasties and, and recipes. And um, so I just put, you can see here, uh, publish, you know, your summary. Uh, so very often the writing task was a summary that came at the end of the whole process. Um, and that's an example of it there. Um, so let's just look at, yeah. So thinking about this particular example then, for formative writing opportunities, did it create, was it interesting? I would, would say yes, because clearly it tapped into some quite interesting topics. There's a lot of input there, a lot of interaction going on, you know, before any kind of writing. Um, audience and collaboration. Um, well, I guess less collaboration than the one we just talked about, um, because basically, is it because I'm standing in the wrong place that this doesn't work? I think it probably is. Yeah, it was about making and maintaining contact with foreign language learners in other countries. Uh, so that's kind of collaboration going on. And clearly, uh, and along the way, there's a very clear audience, um, a lot of interaction going on. But I'm not sure about the writing. Was the writing reviewed only by teachers or did no, students look no, as well? it was each, each student. Yeah. Uh, they work one week in Spanish. And then one in, one week in yeah. alternative weeks. So that, right. that there was one language each, each week. Yeah, so... Yeah, so there was a clear audience again for the, the, the task, which is important, I think, right? Uh, not just the teacher. Yep. Feedback. Uh, again, this wasn't summative. This was formative in that there was no grade given. Um, there was formative feedback given, I understand, and some direct corrective fee feedback, for example, on language. Um, so, you know, there are opportunities for feedback. Published work, well, I think this is where it became more variable. Uh, about two-thirds of, of the, the students in Spain published some, some work on, the, on their site. 90, more than 90% of, of, of York students did. This is according to the report that was written afterwards. I've got these figures from there. Um, so we can see that there's a kind of a bit of a variable uptake when it comes to, to writing and the tasks. Um, let's go back a moment. Yeah, time spent on writing tasks then was variable. Um, and part of the problem here, this is, I'm sure, that... Um, the, those involved with, with setting this up would say was, was that you know, later on in the kind of course when if you don't have a summative element here, if there's no credit for it, when things get busy, um, this is where things fall down, right? And so very often only the most integratively motivated students were continuing to engage and, and you know, carried on with particularly with the writing side of it, which was at the end of the whole process, yeah? Right. I just put up a couple of quotes from the, the Tango report again. Um, you can see that these two kind of highlight some of those issues that we're talking about. Fitting in the work and that becomes difficult when things get busy. Again, this problem, if you don't have credits involved here, are you going to, you know, are you going to sort of spend time on that? Um, but the second one there does show that actually it was very motivating for for that particular student, and the writing is mentioned there. Writing the compositions was something that they particularly valued. So, quite interesting. Let's see what, let's just think about the wider implications then. One of the key things, though, with this kind of project is the time involved, right? There were a lot of resources had to be put together there, yeah? This, this needed funding and buyout of teacher time. Um, also time to sort of set this up with another centre. So, you know, these are obviously logistical problems. We're not looking at something that any teacher can just do, you know, in their normal sort of teaching time, right? Which is definitely an issue. Um, the, the York students seem to be more engaged, possibly because they got more teacher support. Um, but teacher support is absolutely essential, again, in these kind of, using these kind of projects. And it, it's not, um, quite clearly, it's not sort of, something that you can set up and then leave alone. It's something that does demand a lot of time. So I suppose the key question, and something to talk about later, 
is this idea of summative versus formative assessment. How effective, you know, is our, um, are our attempts to, to create these kind of writing tasks if we don't go down that route of having some kind of credits? Um, the, uh, the problem with the credits, of course, is then you get what might be called strategic engagement, right? Because then obviously students are doing maybe sometimes the minimum to get the credits. So it's never, never clear quite you know, how effective that is. So that's two examples of using Google Sites, right? The kind of wiki kind of project for, for writing, for creating writing opportunities. And just while we're talking about that, it's maybe worth referring to portfolios more generally, OK? Um, I think you call, the, in, the, in the Tango site, they were called portfolios. Where the students put in their work, it was called a portfolio. Uh, but in more general terms, portfolio assessment is often summative assessment, right? And it's a collection of documents. It could be just a collection of products or a selection of products where the best are kind of selected. Um, and it's worth mentioning you know, this because you know, e-portfolios are very common. Um, many claims are made for them, right? So focus on process, for example, um, opportunities to revise, producing better writing, um, reflection, encouraging reflection, allowing teachers to see development. So the formative aspects of writing are kind of stressed with, with portfolio assessment. And some of you may um, engage a lot with portfolios. It would be interesting to hear. Um, but generally speaking, they have a summative element, don't they? I mean, that's my understanding, that they're very rarely used simply for formative writing. But in this case, this is something which is quite important. Perhaps they do provide that kind of formative element for um, development and to, to look at development. <coughs> and fostering motivation. Again, I'd be interested to hear, and I'm sure when we come to break out into groups, um, any discussion around um, experiences with portfolio assessment. So individualizing learning is one of the key things. We've got a conference coming up here this summer about that. So again, uh, you know, do these things really work? Um, this is kind of up in the air, I think. Many claims made, and in fact, I've just found a very, very recent review of all this literature, 2014. And those are the kind of claims that are being made here, like motivation, integration, aut autonomy. There's, God, there's a lot there. But when you actually look at this research, what's been written, I think... Um, the research seems to suggest that it's kind of based a lot on questionnaire surveys. Um, there's, there's a need maybe to observe what actually goes on in practice. Um, sometimes technology gets in the way of the learning focus. So, it, you know, looking at very recent, a very recent review of research in that area <laughs> suggests there are still some problems and a lot more work to be done. But I'd be very interested in hearing, and I'm sure anyone with experience of portfolio assessment, it would be good to talk about that later. So moving on then, so we talked about those Google Sites, okay. Another technological kind of tool, if you like, for, you know, writing assessment, well, not writing assessment so much, but formative writing opportunities is, are blogs. And originally, of course, blogs were, uh, you know, web blogs, um, and they were often, you know, individual, and I think there's still an awful lot of that going on in higher education, but we're, we're interested in sort of logs, weblogs, blogs, which are kind of short journals, really, you know, development of journals and chatting spaces for students, yeah? Um, so, again, <coughs> lots of claims for blogs. Um, they provide a non-threatening space for students. This, is a, this was a study done in, I think, in Australia with German learners of German in the university, one of the, the, the key conclusions was that, you know, this was a wonderful, non-threatening space for learners to express themselves. Um, the voice, they provide a voice for learners that may not be there in other, you know, otherwise. And the dialogue, opportunity for dialogue, because, you know, there's constant back and to between teachers and, and learners. That's the idea, at least, right? Um, but again, of course, it puts a heavy emphasis on, on teachers to be involved. I'll just make some reference to an example of my own, a, a module blog that I did last term in, my, in the MAT SOL. That's a content course, of course, not language teaching as such, but the, the students are all um, trainee, in, in, I guess they're novice teachers, that many of them will go on to be teachers, and they're doing a master's program. The, the module itself was teaching and assessing writing, 
So I thought, yeah, here we go. Let's put in a blog. Let's use a blog. Let's see how it works. My aims were here on the right, and this is what I kind of shared with the students. I wanted to get them engaging actively, discussing ideas from you know, our content, from the sessions, the nine teaching weeks that we had with the fellow students. I wanted to create this, this non-threatening way for them to practice writing critically, reflecting on content. Uh, it was writing to learn very much, not developing writing skills as such, more practicing you know, the, their ability just to write and reflect. That's the idea behind a lot of these blogs also and the element of reflection, right? So that was the idea. You can see on the left um, an example, just a, a screenshot. It's not very uh, attractive, really. It's, I mean, I think I'm wondering whether some of the more commercial blogs um, look a lot better than this, but our VLE that we use on, on campus is not obviously the most exciting sometimes for using some of these tools. Um, but, okay, I, I, I'll just show you quickly what the experience was then at the end of the whole term and I'd done a little bit of analysis of posts and comments I asked them to put in a, a one substantive post a week and to try and comment on two students posts obviously the commenting fell down badly as you can see on the the column on the right um, the posting I mean in order to ensure that they had something to talk about and to write about really I set up some little tasks almost on a weekly basis um, different kinds of tasks. So you can see that one task was evaluating a BBC Learn English writing site. And they loved that for some reason. 17 of them, 17 out of 20. There were 20 students on this module. You can see that in the first text, the uh, introductory text task, 19 of them got involved. So that was one student that didn't get engaged at all throughout the whole program. Not quite sure why. Um, but, it, you know, again, this is something that couldn't be forced. It wasn't summative. You know, there were no grades for this. Um, Interesting that there was good reflection on a formative um, task and on feedback that came later. Um, but you can see that you know, there was five student comments for five miscellaneous posts. Shows that you know, students were more interested in commenting on posts which had nothing to do with our content than they were commenting on, on, on content. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. It shows a sort of variable engagement, right? It doesn't show a complete sort of lack of engagement. So... What have we got? We've got audience. Well, um, yes, the audience, it wasn't just the teacher. They were, you know, the whole class did look at each other's comments. There was, some, there was some commenting on posts going on. Was it interesting? That's a difficult one to answer, actually, because we got variable engagement. But we did get some, again, you just get this, this variation. I mean, one student post was about 700 words long, incredibly well written, really thoughtful. I think there might have been one student comment on it, as well as my own. Um, I was commenting on most of them, um, just to make sure to keep the, the interest there, I think. Collaboration, limited commenting, I mentioned, um, it's very individualised, really. That was part of the problem here. Um, occasionally, they, they were supportive of each other with their comments, but it, there wasn't a lot of that. And feedback, well, again, I didn't set it up to give feedback on language. Um, I felt that would have been a problem. I wanted um, the feedback maybe to be on content and to engage with that. It was useful in terms of a feedback loop, actually. That's quite an interesting point because it gave me a lot of feedback, you know, about what the learners were doing, who was taking what in, how they were engaging with that module. Sometimes that was not great feedback for me. <coughs> in other cases, I could see, you know, that some people were really, you know, getting involved with that. So um, that was a kind of... that was. A, an experience with well, on blog again going back to what I, I mentioned earlier the problem we have with with these sort of module teaching that I'm talking about here is we have one module group we move on we do a different module next term we never see the same students again right I, I just think that they need familiarity with this kind of tools and with this kind of teaching and this kind of approach and part of the problem we have is sometimes we, we're providing a kind of one-off attempt at this uh, it would be nice to have the same group to have done a similar kind of thing in, in another module in the following term and to see if that was any more successful, right? But not possible. So things to think about there. Um, the main challenges were the admin load again because, <coughs> uh, yeah, there's a great need to support the group. You know, teachers do need to, to put a lot of time in. Um, and this is, comes out from other studies. 
I try to encourage critical reflection. That's what blogs are often about, but um, they were much more descriptive. Not surprising, you know, first term of a, of a taught master's program, international students who, you know, you know they need time to get used to, to, to this kind of task. <coughs> so one of the questions is how much training then? How much time do they need? Um, and I think that's a, it's a, a key point that may be discussed later. How do we get students familiar with what we want them to do um, in time to make it work? And perhaps the other thing that would be interesting is, and I, I think it might be an interesting study somewhere, what about the quality of the learning experience? You know, do you know, those potential benefits that are always talked about, do they really come out? Do we really see them? So again, maybe ideas for research that I couldn't do at the time. Um, I'm going to skip through these, this, this <coughs> little bit, and I'm going to skip to because I was going to talk briefly about <coughs> learner diaries that some colleagues of mine used. It was an interesting example, but I'll briefly just say that a colleague of mine used to use learner diaries with a, with a group of students from Japan, say, from Korea, students that were here for short-term contract courses. And what was interesting with that, that example was that, that she stopped using the blog, the online blog, and went back to a book a journal, right? And it was quite interesting because um, her experience was that the students were very used to blogging in a very different way, almost social networking, right? So it was all about posting photos, it wasn't really about writing, and they needed to go back, you know, using the old sort of pen and paper seemed to be the best approach with those students in that context. I thought that was quite an interesting example. Um, doesn't quite sort of back up some of the other things we're talking about, but it's an interesting sort of maybe a, a, a point to think about there, you know, how useful sometimes are, is the technology? Should we go back to what we've done before? So just to finish off, and I will be finishing off soon, I hope, um, formative feedback. Um, I wanted to sort of then turn from tasks to feedback on tasks and talk a little bit more about audio and video feedback, okay? Um, commentaries, basically, okay? Um, I'm thinking, my term of reference here is for formative feedback I'm talking about quite a narrow definition giving feedback for my students again in my MET SOL program I'm giving them content and language feedback but it is a content program and my kind of um, context here is is short mini assignments which might be a thousand words long they're the main assignments are four or five thousand words long um, and that mini assignment I give formative feedback on which doesn't have a mark, um, but hopefully helps them improve for the final assignment at the end of the term, okay? So it's an ungraded kind of situation, okay? Um, what about feedback? I mean, here's just two, in the two balloons, you can see some pretty typical comments you might see in student feedback, right? Seen those before, maybe? Look fairly, fairly typical. Um, what's the problem here? Well, Maybe the problem is that it's, it's post-mortem rather than a medical, right? Yeah. Um, so too descriptive, be more analytical. Those are kind of terms that need unpacking, right? But in, in written feedback, we often don't have the space for that. It's very difficult to explain what these things are in a few words. Equally, even with language work, um, you know, students can be told they've got a problem with something, but they want to know, well, how can I correct this? Where do I go to get more help with this? So it could be that we give feedback very often which is accurate but not helpful and is indicative, right? <coughs> it, it identifies problems but it's not developmental. It doesn't help students to improve. So my, so my approach, I suppose, with audio and video commentary is that th this is a kind of solution or one solution to that problem. Um, there's a big advantage. <coughs> All right, now if we're talking about audio... We're talking about podcasts, maybe, right? I've tried that. Um, move quickly on to the video screen commentary, you know, screen capture approach, because that just seems to give us more. We'll talk about that in a moment. But whether it's audio with a podcast or with a video, okay, you get something like four times as many words, right, for the same time that it can take to write 200 words. Now, that's quite a big advantage, but we'll talk more about that in a moment, what kind of advantage. Obviously, there's an issue about speed and delivery, all right, if we're talking about language teaching. Um, my own situation is with relatively advanced learners, so I tend to talk quite naturally, quite fast, and I know from doing some action research with the students that I work with 
that that occasionally is quite challenging for them. But as we'll see, it, it tends to work. So I said I, I used podcasts originally and then moved to what we call you know, screen capture and screencasting. Um, there's just a few little you know, shots there of the, the online tools that you can get and you can download them for free immediately. You can start using one of these and record something in two minutes, publish it in different ways, right? Um, it's been around for several years. The person to, to read on it, maybe in the first instance, is someone called Russell Stannard, who comes from an English language teaching background anyway. Okay, um, I put him in the references. It's basically digital recording of a computer screen um, <coughs> with accompanying audio. Okay, and I'll give you a couple of examples to show you now. So, of course, you know, if you're marking work, you can highlight language, you can highlight content. You can do various things, and you can upload the, the videos in different ways. Now, here's an example. Let's see if it will, will actually work. Let me just, oops, my screen's come off. Oh, let's just go back. Yeah. Hopefully, this is going to work for us. Let's see if it will open. Right. This looks familiar, right? So, Kathy in the audience here um, will be, I'm hoping, not too... No, ha hold on a second. I, it won't be long. I'm just going to put it on quickly. I'm just going to put it on pause because I need the sound. I don't know if we can hear it. Okay, here's an example. Well, <coughs> Donc, pensez à quelque chose d'autre. Et, et on a l'impression vraiment que euh, on se répète. Euh, donc, pourquoi ne pas mettre tout simplement si. Le gouvernement ne représente pas le peuple, virgule. Right, I'll stop it there. I, I mean, we could listen to a lot more of that. But um, I think the point here is, let's go try and go back to our uh, slides. Yeah, okay. So what we saw there was just one, one approach to it, right? Um, Kathy was basically, as she read, she was annotating a text. And you could see how she was highlighting bits of the text and talking about how you know, the writing could be improved in different ways, you know. Um, now, I think you, you've since changed that kind of approach somewhat. Um, my own approach is, is slightly different and has been for a while. Um, this is the kind of text that I would get. What I tend to do is to read a text first, a digital version, put some annotations, written word annotations at the side, which are kind of marginal comments, right? And they help then to guide me in what I'm going to say. I'll pick up maybe one or two of the most important ones in the commentary that I make. Um, so I'll just show you an example of this if I can. Let's see. Um, another quick example. Yeah, so first of all, marginal comments, and then I will record a commentary without any preparation. Okay. And let's see a different example here. And so your big problem with the, the structure is the paragraphing, because as you can see, one heading, one section, one long paragraph. And actually, you know, if I look at, um, you know, this, this first section, you're, you're mixing a number of different things here. You begin by defining genres, and then you start to talk about how, for example, um, these are used in the classroom. Then you start to talk about their um, disadvantages. So, that, you know, you're mixing a number, a number of different topics. You're not developing one topic. Um, just because you have a section which is about a specific topic, that doesn't mean it's it's all has to go in one paragraph. You have you know subtopics within that that need to be developed. So think about that for paragraphing. It will help. Uh, Just stop there for a minute. Okay. So you can see how I I tended to hi highlight language issues. Sometimes I would talk about them. Sometimes it would be for the student to go away and look at. You can see how um, what happens here is that you you pick up. It's not the the. Amount of feedback means that you just throw much more feedback at the student. What you tend to do is pick up an individual point and go into detail about it, right? Um, that's one of the keys here. Let's see if I can get back into, all right, what's my best way of getting back into where we are? The point here is then it, that we've got more feedback, but it's not, it's not actually just multiplying feedback by a factor of four. It's the nature of the feedback. The audio and the video commentary pick up a, a smaller number of points, and they develop them, they explain them. So it's a kind of less is more principle, I think. And it's, this is why I really feel that it is a useful, very useful way of giving feedback. Um, the depth, 
is the issue, I think, and the depth really does make a difference. This is one of my students. I've been doing, trying to do a, a little bit of action research on uh, two groups of students that I used this approach with last year, and I did some um, focus group um, interviews, and I did Think Aloud with the students, going back through their screencast to see how much they had taken in and what they did with them. Um, this is one comment. Uh, you can see here that the, the student felt really encouraged by it, which is the important thing, I think. It's, it's, about, it's in depth again, and, and I think it's valued for that. But also it's the personalization, right? Um, we saw with Cathy's example, talking through, it's actually reader response, isn't it? And I think that, that the writer that the student responds better to that because <coughs> they can see how the teacher's engaging with their work in a way that often written feedback doesn't do, okay? So it's building relationships. Now, um, it, at tertiary education, we need this. We don't have the contact between teachers and students. We have larger and larger classes. It seems to work very well, you know, in this kind of context. Now, in the school context, it may be very different, and that's one of the things that I'd be interested to hear and to discuss. Um, the, the implications maybe of this kind of approach in, in, a, in a different kind of context. So here we get an example from one of my commentaries again, but it, again it shows how you can be encouraging, how you automatically tend to, even though there's a lot of negative feedback perhaps that you're giving, you can you know, turn it into something that's more positive and encouraging. So we're tapping into emotions, really, again. Feedback is very emotional experience. I think we'd all relate to that. Um, so it, it's about being friendly. You can do that. You, you've got, you're making contact with the student. Um, but is it a question of forced engagement? Because I found that um, what I was doing was sometimes challenging for the students. They had to com continually stop listen again, but it made them take notes. It made them actually pay attention, notice what was going on in that feedback. And the group that I actually did this research with, I think I'd, I had nine students in the, in the research group out of a possible something like 36 in the two groups. And of those nine, something like seven or eight, all admitted that they, you know, they took notes and they, they attended in this kind of way. The problem, of course, is that there's clearly a kind of comprehension issue as well, right? And for those who are not, you know, th that could be an issue, certainly for language learners of lower levels. So again, more research needed there, you know, more thought given to that perhaps. But overall, I'm going to just go straight to some final thoughts on formative feedback. Overall, it doesn't... You know, I wouldn't say that this kind of approach replaces face-to-face -face feedback at all, but I do think it complements written feedback, okay? Um, I use audio and written comments together, as you can see, and I think um, that can work well for students. They, they still have a record, a written record they can refer to, and they often say that that's what they want as well. Problems, this would be interesting to hear from discussion. Um, teacher take-up, I think it's still... I'm surprised that more, people, more teachers are not using this, right? Now, why not? Maybe it's because some teachers are not comfortable hearing their own voice. And that's a serious comment because one of my colleagues who does use audio feedback admits to feeling quite fairly... doesn't, doesn't feel comfortable doing it still, even though she believes in doing it. Um, so that's one issue, perhaps. Um, and maybe another one is working in higher education particularly. Why bother? Why put the effort in? It, it, we've got its summative approaches dominate the way that we that we work, that we give feedback. We have to spend lots of time writing, you know, detailed reports on summative work. So why make the effort to to learn how to use these kind of tools if it's really, you know, a bit of a sideshow? I wonder whether that's part of the problem we've got here. But okay, using audio and video, I'd like to hear certainly when we get the discussion going later what people's thoughts are for that and in different contexts. And finally then, I didn't mention MAL. We haven't talked about mobile assisted language learning, right, which is another sort of technological approach you could be using. And Twitter, I know people use, it, use this. For writing, for, for writing tasks, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear if anyone has any examples of those, right? Um, I think, Thomas, you've used, but, so maybe you might talk about that later. 
Is there a digital divide problem still, right? Here in the university, we've got access to very good, you know, tools here. <laughs> Everything works. But I know in some schools, my wife works in an independent school, the technology just isn't very good, right? And that could still be a major problem here. We need to think about that. And what about skills? Do teachers need more training, right? And clearly, there is a kind of expectation that we use technology, but is it innovation for innovation's sake? Is it just because it's there doesn't mean it's necessarily, you know, the best suited thing for us. So we need to think about that. I think in the end, though, teachers are curious. If they're curious, then they sort of commit to using something. When they do that and they start to believe in it, they can make it work for them. So I'm going to leave it there, okay? Right, I've gone on longer than I meant, meant to, I'm sure. And I'm going to leave you some questions. But I'll hand over to Thomas. I can put the questions up, but Thomas, do you want to yeah. tell everybody what you want to do what next? What do you have to do now?